Joseph, it's 2 a.m. Why aren't you coming to bed? I have to crack this code. I just can't figure out how to make this playable. Hey everybody, Joseph Rothschild here, aka MBT, back again with another episode of 10 Minute Testing. Now it's come to my attention that some people don't find my spellcaster deck ratios sufficiently spellbinding. So today I've decided to prove myself the master of magicians by taking a second crack at the deck most likely to attract Timmy's attached to a Timaeus, Dark Magician. Get your comments ready now because the next thing you'll see is the deck list. So here's the list, and well, at least there's three Dark Magicians this time. As always, I'll give you a background about the archetype, a little bit of a discussion about what I hope the deck can do, and of course, the card by card. So firstly, for those of you that don't know, but don't know, <laughs> how on earth would you not know about Dark Magician? Why are you watching a Yu-Gi-Oh! video if you don't even have cursory knowledge of the title character's ace monster? Do you show up to Dragon Ball Z videos and ask who the guy is who's always hanging out with Vegeta? Anyway, Dark Magician is a 2500 attack normal monster enabled by almost two decades of support that has trickled from Konami's teat like mana from heaven to scrubby sorcerers nationwide. Their general game plan is thus. Step 1. Via a couple of their Omni Searchers, find a Dark Magic Circle and a way to special summon Dark Magicians to the field, and Step 2. Pray that banishing one thing a turn is enough. This may not seem like enough of a proactive plan to take down Tier 1, but DM does have a couple of things going for it that permit it to compete. Firstly, their advantageous typing means it's entirely possible to recur them with Eternal Soul and banish over a dozen times over the course of the game by linking into Lynx Spiders and the like. And secondly, their extremely powerful consistency tools and lack of extra deck usage means you're able to play cards like Pot of Extravagance alongside Omni Searchers. And thirdly, they're one of those special kinds of decks that can play a little card called Eradicator Epidemic Virus. While EEV is certainly not the format defining super threat bad duelists like myself expected it to be, it's definitely fine, especially against Sky Striker. And lastly, this list is engineered almost exclusively by Squeaky the First, that's at Squeaky the First, number 8885 on Discord. Trust me when I say this man knows what he's talking about, he is positively pregnant with DM tech, and truthfully spends about 8 hours a day arguing in various DM discords and FB groups about the reasonability of playing 2i. So with that, let's get into the card by card. First, we've got three of the big boy himself as reparations to any of you who watched my last profile and had an aneurysm. After that are three Apprentice Illusion Magician, three Magician's Rod, and three Effect Veiler, who has reasonable enough interactions with Magician's Rod to include as the Hand Trap of choice. After that are the Spells, three Pot of Extravagance, three Dark Magic Circle, and one of my singular inclusion to the list, Illusion Magic, which unbricks very specific hands of Magician's Rod, DM Circle, a way to summon DM, but none of the Magician himself. Self. After that are the traps, three trap trick and their targets, three navigation, three infinite impermanence, and three virus. After that is three summon limit, my current floodgate of choice, three eternal soul, imperial order, skill drain, and solemn judgment to spike evenly. In the extra, we've got an extravagance board. Three Ebon Illusion Magician, two each of Bora Lode and Boral Sword, Saruya as well, Nightmare's Unicorn and Phoenix, and Link Spider. So with that, let's jump into the games. Our first match is up against Orcist. Orcist is already an extremely powerful Link engine in a variety of decks, but will come into its own as a deck archetype once Orchestrated Climax and Orcist Dingirsu are released. Unfortunately for us, our opponent operates in the future and is playing both of those cards. Thankfully, we are going first, and our hand is pretty good. We're going to start with a Dark Magic Circle, then activating the effect of Magician's Rod, Special Summoning an Apprentice Illusion Magician for a Dark Magician, and passing it back to our opponent. Our opponent will draw for turn and Normal Summon a Mathematician. This will send a copy of Harp Horror to Graveyard to get a cannon. We'll activate Eternal Soul to Special Summon a Dark Magician, and activate Dark Magical Circle's effect in order to banish this Mathematician so they don't get a draw before activating Summon Limit. At end step, we'll activate EEV, Call Traps, and they'll allow us to draw for turn. The game is effectively over from here. I don't think Orcist can beat Summon Limit, and they'll 
concede. Not a particularly exciting first game, but when you're playing Floodgates, you know what you're signing up for. Our second match is up against Cyber Dragon, and once again we're going first. We've drawn completely differently here. We don't have access to DM or Magician's Rod or Dark Magic Circle, but we do have Pot of Extravagance. We're going to start by firing off that sucker because, well, it's the only thing we can do. We'll banish six cards because I have no respect for the extra deck. We'll set three cards and pass it back to our opponent. They lead with a Twin Twister, which is upsetting. We'll Solemn Judgment, bringing ourselves to 4,000 against an OTK deck. They'll then activate Cyber Repair Plant to get themselves a Galaxy Soldier. They'll Special Summon it, but we have just the infinite impermanence for that. It's unfortunate that we don't have a very good follow-up play after they Normal Summon a Cyber Dragon, but we can always activate Magician's Navigation in order to get both a Rod for potential future setup plays and a Dark Magician to our side of the field. In Main Phase 1, we'll activate a second Pot of Extravagance. Thankfully, we don't draw into a third. Our opponent will chain Cybernetic Overflow, which we will negate by activating the Magician's Navigation in our graveyard. We find a circle and nothing off of it, but it means that future setups will yield rewards. Our opponent draws a Cyber Repair Plant, that's pretty bad for us, until you recognize that we drew Imperial Order and can prevent the activation. We'll then activate the effect of Magician's Rod in Graveyard, so we can Normal Summon him on our turn. Of course, we do draw one for turn, that's always how it seems to go. We'll attack for 1600 directly and the game is effectively over from this position. We can banish whatever they summon. Here they're going to summon a Cyber ATN, they'll then activate its effect, we'll activate Eternal Soul to bring back Dark Magician, and then activate Magician's Rod's effect to bring back Magician's Rod. We'll then activate Effect Veiler so we don't take damage in the meantime, because I think it's the only way we lose the game. We'll activate Eternal Soul to bring back Dark Magician, Normal Summon a Magician's Rod, use Magician's Rod's effect, and then attack into the ATN for 25 and directly for 16. For turn, our opponent is going to draw a spell, which we will rip with a copy of EEV. Well, it's time for game three, which is usually when we start playing against meta strategies, but I'm not entirely convinced that we have an adequate understanding of how the deck plays against Rogue. Our third game is up against Raid Raptors. This is a deck that's exceptionally powerful, almost exclusively because of their new Link monster, Raid Raptor Wise Tricks. I've had my eye on this strategy for a long time, and we'll be looking at it shortly. Unfortunately for us, our opponent is going first, and while we do have a hand trap, things have to go right for us to win this. They'll start with an Allure of Darkness, then Normal Summon a copy of Mimicry Lanius, they'll Special Summon a Fuzzy Lanius, then activate the effect of Raid Raptor Nest to get a Pain Lanius to hand. They'll go into Wise Tricks and activate the effect. We do have to activate Infinite Impermanence here. I don't think we can beat the resolution. They're going to get another copy of a Fuzzy Lanius, then activate Mimicry Lanius' effect for a Readiness, set two cards, and pass it back. The Readiness is a giant problem. We'll activate Pot of Indulgence, and what do we find? But, ugh, nothing. We'll Special Summon a copy of Apprentice Illusion, Normal Summon a Magician's Rod for a copy of Circle, and we whiff on it. We'll go to Battle Phase, but of course that only prompts the Readiness. We can't actually destroy this. Wise Tricks but we've set up a pretty intimidating back row for their next turn. They'll start by activating Raid Raptor Nest, but will Infinite Transients their Wise Tricks, turning off the Raid Raptor Nest in the same column. Then, they'll summon a copy of Vanishing Lanius and go into a second Fuzzy, before going into a second copy of Wise Tricks, which we do have an Effect Veiler for. That's two we don't have to worry about. They'll then use Force Tricks' effect, Wise Tricks' effect triggers, but doesn't fire, and we draw for turn. We find another copy of Pot of Extravagance, that's fantastic, we're almost out of extra deck cards, but we do draw into a couple of meaningful ones. We'll attack over this wise tricks, and finally, will Tribute summon a Dark Magician to get the Force Tricks off of their side of the field. They draw into a Shave Force, they'll activate Swallow's Nest, and I'm pretty sure that's the only way they get back into the game, so we'll activate Solemn Judgment in response, then trigger the Grave Effect of Magician's Rod. For turn, we draw another Dark Magical Circle, we'll fire it, and oh my god, it's Eternal Soul, thank god. That means we can get an Illusion Magic off of this copy of uh, Magician's Rod, set the copy of Eternal Soul, and pop off later. We'll do that right now, activating the effect of Eternal Soul, and the effect of Dark Magical Circle, and the effect of Magician's Rod, so we can add more cards to hand. We'll do just that, activating Eternal Soul so we can banish the last card on our opponent's side of the field, then activating the effect of Magician's Rod, going to battle phase, prompting the readiness from Graveyard of course, then activating EEV Calling Spell card. Our opponent draws for turn, and it's another Soul Shave Force so they concede. What I've appreciated is that while the decks were beating our Rogue, they're not exactly bad. It's not like we're cleaning house against Cloudian. These are real, recognizable archetypes that people are, or in the future will be, bringing to events. Our fourth deck is no slouch either, it's zombies. We're going first, and our hand is stacked. We'll start by normal summoning a copy of Magician's Rod. We find a Dark Magic Circle, then use Dark Magic Circle for a second one. We'll discard that to Apprentice Illusion Magician to get Dark Magician, set three, and pass it back to our opponent. Our opponent's going to start by activating Zombie World, setting a card, then activating Danger Choop. We miss it, and pretty badly too, that's Baylor Drock. So we'll activate Navigation, use the effect of Dark Magic Circle to banish the set, and Eradicator to get rid of the Zombie World, while Baylor Drock is not a problem. Afterwards, our opponent is going to special summon a copy of Chook from hand, and we'll flip Summon Limit, prompting a concession. 
feeling pretty invincible right now, so I suppose it's time for a reality check. Our fifth match is up against Salaman Great, and we've opened pretty good. We don't have access to Dark Magical Circle or Eternal Soul, but we do have Summon Limit. That should prevent any shenanigans while we can actually find a play. We're going to activate Apprentice Illusion Magician. They're going to activate Infinite Transients, but that's not too big of a deal. We'll go ahead and set three cards and pass it back to our opponent. They draw a Debugger for turn, which just might be. They're going to use Debugger to get Gazelle, then go to Veilinx. They'll activate the effect of Veilinx, and there's Summon Limit. This should prevent them from popping off this turn at the very least. They'll activate Spinny's effect and pass it back to us. We draw an Extravagance off the top. Thank you, God. And we find a Dark Magical Circle and, well, the second Dark Magical Circle. Maybe in the future we'll be able to activate it. We'll pass it back to our opponent, setting an Infinite and Permanent in their spell and trap card zone slot. They'll activate the effect of Foxy and Whiff before going into Veilinx and passing it back once again. Now, Foxy is actually quite bad in the graveyard specifically for us because we don't yet have access to a copy of Dark Magician. We'll pass it back. Our opponent will <sighs> activate Foxy's effect to special summon itself, destroying summon limit, and now we have to actually play the game. They'll go into Mirage Stalio, into Jack Jaguar, into Gazelle using Gazelle's effect. We will affect Veiler the Gazelle, ah, but the set card is dragged down by the grave. I don't think that's worth negating, but we'll find out momentarily. They'll then go into Heat Leo. We will Solemn Judgment. I think that's the end of their turn, but they can still make another Sunlight Wolf, unfortunately. Resetting the Rage, bringing back the Jack Jaguar in order to trigger Sunlight Wolf and go into a Gazelle again. They'll use Heat Leo to shuffle this set card. We'll chain it in response and Illusion Magic, and they'll attack directly for 2300. We have one turn to turn this around, but we do have Dark Magic Circle. We'll go ahead and fire that sucker, and ah, there's Salaman Great Rage. Well, I can't beat that, unfortunately, and Gazelle follow-up is just devastating. We'll Normal Summon an Effect Veiler and Concede. Alright, so now that we're acutely aware of the boundaries of the deck's power, it's time for our best of three versus meta. We've picked something a little lower on the tier list, True Draco. It's at least comparable, it plays a lot of Floodgates, just like us. Unfortunately, our Floodgates aren't particularly good against the deck that doesn't care if you negate their monster's effects. We're going first at the very least, we gotta make something out of this hand. We're gonna start by normal summoning a rod for a circle, we activate circle, ooh, and navigation is big. That means we can go into Apprentice, get a Dark Magician, set three, and pass it back to our opponent. The idea is that we'll go ahead and banish their copy of Dragonic Diagram when they activate it, but unfortunately I get a little greedy and wait until they actually activate the effect. That means they'll be able to resolve the effect before I'm able to activate the effect of Dark Magical Circle. It does resolve, but we are able to banish this copy of Dragonic Diagram. Unfortunately for our opponent, they don't have a particularly compelling follow-up play. They're going to go into a Mono Iwato and a copy of Ignis. We'll activate Skill Drain, then we'll activate Illusion Magician's effect in the damage step to prevent our opponent from destroying our monsters. We'll do it again and they send the Amano to the graveyard. They're able to shuffle three cards back and draw one. What do they find but a pot of duality? And for the first time, I think ever, they don't find anything particularly compelling off of it. For turn, we draw Magician's Rod, which is great, I guess. It, its effect is negated, but it does hit for 16. We'll get in for 16 and 16, putting our opponent at a healthy 15. For turn, they draw an Ignis Heat. They'll go ahead and activate True Draco Apocalypse. They'll destroy their copy of Disciples to destroy our set card, then draw one card, activate Pot of Desires, and activate True Draco Heritage to tribute Ignis Heat, go into battle phase, and hit over us for 16. They pass it back to us, and what do we find for turn? But a second Dark Magician, are you kidding me? Well, let's turn the Magician's Rod to defense and hope for the best. They're going to Heritage to Tribute again for a Majesty Maiden. God, that's annoying. They'll use Heritage to draw. It's an Imperial Order. They'll get in for 2300 and 2400. Things are looking particularly grim. For turn, we draw... Ooh... Okay, Eternal Soul might get us out of this as long as they don't draw a Dragonic Diagram. They'll go to Battle Phase, we'll activate Eternal Soul so we can get a Dark Magician out. Then in Main Phase 2, they'll activate Card of Demise, we will Magician's Navigation, it, and then they'll go ahead and pass it back. We draw for turn, and are our 2,500 Vanilla Beaters actually going to win us this game? We'll activate Eternal Soul again to get another one out of our hand and eat over Ignis. They're almost out of monsters, we might be able to do this. For turn, they draw a Disciples that has to draw something relevant for them to have a chance here. They draw an Apocalypse which would be able to clear parts of our board, but they can't set it because their board is full of effect and spell negation. Alright, so it's time for game two, and all we have to do after that first one, with a lot of back and forth and interesting interplay, is steal one of these next two games. Unfortunately, it looks like our opponent is likely to do so because they have the first crack at Imperial Order. They'll go ahead and set four and pass it back to us, which is extremely frightening. We draw for turn, what do we find? But, oh, an infinite impermanence. We'll normal summon a copy of Magician's Rod to get a Dark Magical Circle, we'll activate it, they'll activate True Draco Apocalypse, and Imperial Order. They'll tribute summon this copy of Ignis, then use the effect of Apocalypse in Graveyard to destroy our Magician's Rod, 
rod. Afterwards, we set five and pass it back. Now, notably, we have impermanence in the same column as imperial order. They'll attack in for 2500, then activate heritage and pass it back to us. We draw nothing for turn, so we'll pass it back to our opponent. They draw for turn, and what do they find? But similarly, nothing. They'll attack us directly for another 2500 points of damage, and it's time to get cute. For turn, we draw a copy of Illusion Magic. We'll activate this copy of Infip turning off the copy of Imperial Order. Afterwards, we'll normal summon an Effect Veiler, a Spellcaster, and... Oh my god. Infinite Impermanence is reciprocal. We had accidentally zone-locked ourselves and had no choice but to negate our own spell card. Alright, so our opponent zone-locked themselves with Useless Floodgates Game 1. We zone-locked ourselves with Useless Floodgates Game 2. But unfortunately, Game 3 is going to show the massive advantage that True Draco has over something like Dark Magician. It's able to turn its Useless Floodgates into meaningful card advantage. We're going first, which is excellent, except our hand isn't particularly good. A lot of these cards are game-winning, but a uh, summon limit does not shine against True Draco. Our opponent draws a rivalry for turn. They'll activate Disciples to tribute summon a copy of Ignis. They'll activate the Grave Effect of Disciples to destroy our EEV before activating Dragonic Diagram, destroying Skill Drain, a floodgate that usually does nothing in order to get a card they really need. They'll activate another Terraforming off of a Card of Demise, destroying once again a bad floodgate, Rivalry of Warlords, and turning it into a copy of Dynamite Knight. They'll pop these additional floodgates that do nothing, the monarchs erupt in order to get to their linear plays, put more damage on board, and find meaningful interaction. Inversely, we draw a useless floodgate for turn, and are subject to a significant amount of life point damage. For turn, we draw oh, a second Dark Magician, so we'll concede. So we're back with the deck, and I have really bad news for the Yugi stands in the audience. We'll do the pros and the cons. First, the pros. One is that it's consistent. Now I know this comes up a lot in the pros, but seasoned DM players will remember a time before Apprentice when the opener wasn't particularly guaranteed. Two, the new silver bullet trap cards whip, especially alongside Trap Trick. It's an incredible win condition against spell decks and an incredible consistency piece for navigation searches. And three, this is gonna sound weird, but DM is a bit of a chonker. The deck snowballs damage exceptionally quickly and will catch individuals who think they can slow roll against Rogue with quick OTKs. And the cons. One, it's not, it's not particularly good. I, I'm sorry. The consistent power play just isn't as impactful, advantageous, or game winning as comparable searchable lines from tier 1, 2, and 3 meta archetypes. One banish pales in comparison to two Colossus and a Dragon Abyss, for example. Two, it's interruptible. If you Twin Twister, Eternal Soul, and DM Circle on activation, it causes a pain to the DM pilots so strong that all of their living relatives feel it. And three, it's expensive as hell. The cards that make it competitive are hundreds of dollars, and even its engine pieces are still up there. This makes it a hard sell for local play. All in all, it's unfortunate that Yugi's impact on the game so far has been mediocre nostalgia bait. We're still waiting for Dark Magician Double Helix, but until it comes out, I think the Master of Magicians is destined for the dumpster. So that's that. I look forward to your well-thought-out justifications for why I should be playing Magician of Dark Illusion. If you want to see me play the decks I make on this show on stream, I'm on twitch.tv slash mbtygo every Monday from 7 to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and if you have an idea for a deck or archetype you want to see me play on a future episode of this show, let me know in the comments section below and I'll see what I can do. Otherwise, I'll see you next time.